let's start okay good so thanks thanks everyone and thanks a lot for joining this session good morning afternoon evening late evening depending on the location you are right thanks a lot for joining so the way we have structured this uh, session is it's going to be 60 minutes we have an, a, a few questions which uh, are raised by the participants only so we are going to walk through uh, we are going to ask these question you know, to jeff and he, based on his experience he is going to respond to those and obviously you have time you have an opportunity wherever you have anything to uh, as in a follow up you are most welcome to do so right the one quick thing i would like to highlight this time you may have noticed we are using zoom meeting not in a webinar option so this is the first time we are giving it a try we are not uh, we, uh, we are not sure how good or bad it would be but let's see how it goes we, we uh, in webinar it looks like more of an a one way we don't know we are to whom we are talking in a, in a meeting actually we can see few of the faces so that that's the only idea we have right so let's uh, let's start and before we jump into it let's have an, maybe a quick intro about jeff right i think most of you must be uh, aware of him you may have, you must have read all his books but just in a quick intro he is uh, he is the author of the top 3 best books in the agile community all about mastery scrum mastery product mastery and the very recent the team mastery right the, we, most of us may be following all his blogs videos and all that stuff right and for, uh, there, there may be an even a single scrum master who have not read his the scrum mastery book right so i i don't want to Uh, I I would say I, I may not have an, uh, all the things which I can talk about Jeff, but uh, I I would give him an option maybe if he wants to talk about uh, himself. Um, not my favorite thing to talk about, to be honest. But um, it's it's yes, I I, I really do enjoy getting the messages from my books. Um, writing is just one part of what I do. Most of my time is spent working with with organisations at at a leadership team level, trying to help them. work out how to how to turn what they've got into something a little bit more uh resilient for the for the situation they find themselves in right now dealing with all the complexities that go along with that all the all the people dynamics um that's what that's what keeps me interested that's what gets me up in the morning um and uh yeah i've turned those stories into something that uh, that people can remember hopefully good good thanks thanks jeff so uh, i'm not going to share my screen so it, so that we can uh, we I, we have put you in the spotlight uh, jeff so you will be on the bigger screen okay right? so uh, all of you should have that uh, link which uh, for the for the questions deck in case if you don't i i, I will paste it again but let, let's start with the very first question right the, the very first one and i don't know who asked it so i don't want to so the very teamwork right we we everyone know that teamwork is on a really a very relevant competitive ad advantage but why still so many organization fail to create great teams what is your thought on it so my 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 thoughts are based on my experience which which are that um the word team is used a lot more than it's due within organizations so i see a lot of groups of people teams that really aren't um and so they're not really given the chance to develop all the bonds and all the awareness and the personal levels of commitment and accountability that go into making a really successful team uh there's a lot of changing around so you see a lot of people moving from from group to group team to team uh and that that always breaks the flow up quite a bit that team then has to to reform and one of the biggest things that i didn't really think gets is enough credit um in 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 the in the changes that scrum really focused on is the idea around a cross functional team so from what from i've been part of component teams i've been part of groups i've been part of cross functional teams and one of the big differences around cross functional teams is they have the ability to deliver end to end value and there's there's very little else that that i've experienced that cements that feeling of team than actually as a group being able to take a problem and see it through and solve it together not having any dependencies outside of their unit and so that that cross functional nature where you can have that end to end autonomy is a massive part of it so i i think you see that you've got a much greater chance of of having a team and for most organizations getting from where they are to a fully cross functional team with a 
the very holistic definition of done takes quite a bit of time. That, that's quite normal. There is a there is a, an evolution rather than, than a revolution there. Um, and I think um, another, another something that goes hand in hand with this is that sense of patience. Do we have the patience for the, for the journey ahead? And we have our habits, we have our status quo and the status quo will always be pulling because we, we like the familiar as human beings we, we we like the familiar we don't really feel comfortable with new even though we like new we don't feel comfortable with new and a big part of that is a focus on the wrong e so as an organization we typically really like efficiency and, and people we really like efficiency and efficiency is a good thing in the right context when you have predictability and you have repeatability, efficiency is fantastic because you can drive out waste. You can drive out, and I, I hate waste. But when you don't have predictability, when you don't have repeatability, when we don't know what we don't know, we're trying to create something new. Efficiency is exactly the wrong thing to be pushing for. And that, what we really need is, is effectiveness. So you've got teams that are being pushed for efficiency when really they want to be effective. You've got a massive conflict. You've got a massive tension. Um, so that that sense of well, if I'm if I'm going to be part of this team, and we're trying to push for something else that the organisation doesn't value, do I feel comfortable with that? And as a leader, if I'm trying to create autonomy within a team, an autonomous unit, what's my role now? Where do I add value? Am I important anymore? Uh, letting go of control. All of those factors go into sort of undermining all the chances that we have of creating a great team, which is why you may master some of them within an organization, but it's rare to master all of them. Yep, yep. That's, that's, what do you think? That's, yep, yep. I think I, I, I agree, but I, I would like to ask others, whoa, 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 whoa. anyone would like to add or comment anything here? You may be on mute if you are trying to talk. So, so Jeff, uh, one question or comment I have. Sometimes I've also seen the other way around. I mean, this word team and teamwork is actually used, overused, I would say, or, or the concept is overused. I've seen which work can be done individually also. Now, now because there is a concept of team, five people will get, get around and it will delay. I mean, if it requires input from others, then it's a good thing. But at times it does not require everything to be done through a team. What do you think? I mean, are we overdoing this thing or, or what's your thought on that? I can see that there could be, there could be a risk of that. My, my, my natural response to that is, is how, how important is that skill? Because if that skill that that person is, is responsible for, it's more efficient for that one individual to do it. But is that person becoming a bottleneck within the overall system, within the overall process? Uh, it's a nice feeling as, a, as an individual. If I'm the only person in the company that can do a particular thing and I'm really, really good at it, I feel so valuable. I feel indispensable. I'm like, I'm like a hero. And I know that, you know, I'm so secure in my position. But the organisation itself is to a degree being held to ransom. And this is where this is where I talk about this efficiency versus effectiveness, because, yeah, it will be less efficient for somebody less skilled and less experienced than me to be doing this as well. But if it enables us as an organization to do more things that require that skill than than they could, if I was the only person doing it, then that's the right thing for the company. Um, that's effective. It's not efficient, but it's effective. And I get the. I get the anxiety, I get the uncertainty, I get the vulnerability that comes along with that for that particular individual. Uh, and it's, it's, it is scary um, because it feels like I'm putting my job at risk. But ultimately, I'm putting my company at risk if I don't, which is putting my job at risk. Yep, good. So I, 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 uh, just, just a follow up to that, I think that's our second question. It's more about the, the individual versus the team. Right, we, in, 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 in any agile transformation or organization, we are talking about that cross-functional work, right? But there will always be some skills which are very niche, mm -hmm. right? Maybe the security, maybe performance, or maybe some hardware stuff. So 
how, uh, the, the question is how how to bridge that gap between an a uh, between those niche skill or maybe between an a dev versus qa or dev, uh, how how to bring that cross functionality in in such an environment whatever whatever that so you're going to call them a niche skill I, I, and i get that and i'm happy to use that term ultimately however that they're, they're a bottleneck or they're a potential bottleneck and regardless of what that skill or what that bottleneck is we we optimize our process to that bottleneck and then we then we exploit the bottleneck and, we, and if we need to and we can we find a way of, of removing that bottleneck and as soon as we've removed it we find another one so whatever it is it's it's even if we solve it it's only going to be temporary but we keep we keep going for me i, I tend to view that the take the view that you know first of all everybody wants their work to work everybody wants to be contributing to something successful um, and the the more niche something is for me at least the harder it is for me to understand it if someone in my team has a real specialist skill um, now i was told once by someone i consider to be quite wise that if you can't explain what you do to a 10 year old then you don't really understand your job um, and I like to think that that's quite an important part of, of what I do is helping people explain what they do to other members of their team. Um, because knowledge is the first step. Awareness is the first step. And sometimes just explaining it to a 10 year old or me, because I'm equivalent of a 10 year old and I don't really understand a lot of things, helps, helps them understand how they can tailor what they do to the rest of the team. And, and really that's, that's, that's the first step for me. So regardless of, of how niche it is, is it important for us? Would we as an organization get value from being more effective in this area, being able to increase throughput in a particular skill set than we currently have? Is this a bottleneck for us? Uh, if it is, then we need to figure out how to be more effective. Uh, and, and that's that's as simple as it gets. Yes, it's going to be tricky. Yes, there will be skills that will be a lot more difficult to, to do. But I also view the fact that if, if we don't do it, if it's needed and we don't do it, there's somebody out there that is. Yep, yep. that's true. That's true. So it's, uh, shall we call it as an initial skill or shall we call it as a bottleneck? That's, that's good. Okay, good. So let, let, let's move on. So the next part is, I think, I, 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 uh, in a traditional uh, organization, right? We we we, we have an, a lot of uh, project managers right, who are, who who used to have uh, our uh, role. Now with this, uh, when an organization start moving to this Scrum, so we have an, uh, either the Scrum master, product owner, or maybe the development team. This is what people think that these are the only thing we have. The rest all are gone, right? But as in a project manager, I, I have an option. Either I can go to towards the Scrum master role or maybe the product owner, right? But what what is your take? Uh, uh, what, uh, how the, my previous project management experience would be helpful to me to moving towards the product management journey? So you're looking at moving from a project manager to a product owner. Yep. yep. I, I see that work quite well. Mm -hmm. um, so for what it's worth, I used to be a project manager. Um, and I found that while I've done both roles, I probably have more of a, a, an affinity to the Scrum Master role um, because although I think I'm a big advocate of, of a product owner having a very diverse range of leadership styles, including an element of servant leadership, the, the sort of people development, the people facilitation is a lot stronger in the Scrum Master role and that's one of my strengths. So if, the, if it was a particular individual, I'd be asking them to consider what their strengths are. And what they enjoy and and how they how they how they contribute more and get more of a of a almost sense of fulfillment from their role uh, and the product owner is a very different role uh, so there is a quite a degree of uh, responsibility there as there's a lot of decision making power if you like or decision making responsibility um they're needing to 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 make some pretty pretty tough calls they're going to have to to manage a lot more uh, conflicting personalities, if you like. So while a Scrum Master is going to be facilitating a cross-functional team, 
who who all have different experiences and mindsets and and backgrounds they all have a common goal the product owner is working with people who aren't necessarily sharing a common goal because they have their own objectives and agendas as stakeholders so stakeholder one they may win by sta stakeholder two not getting what they want and that's a different challenge uh, for, a, for a product owner being able to read and analyze market conditions uh, being able to work a lot more with ambiguity and and make decisions with incomplete information these are very different different skills um, there's a lot more creation in the world of, of product management but as a project manager I look at, well, what makes you a, a successful project manager? And I, this is probably where I would struggle to answer the question as, as well as you would like, because I've worked with so many project managers and a lot of them are very different. Uh, I don't think there is one way to be a project manager. So I played on my strengths of, of working with individuals, whereas I know project managers who really knew their domain in depth. And so kind of were the experts in the domain uh, and used that as one of their strengths to, to be a successful project manager. So I, that would probably be where I would look if I, if what, what strengths do I have that make me a successful project manager? Uh, and then how could I leverage those in this new role, knowing full well that any strength that I have can potentially become a weakness if I overplay it or use it in the wrong context. Okay. Uh, does, that, does that make sense? Yep, it does, it does, it does. It does a lot. A anyone has any comment or maybe a follow-up question on this? So I know I know we may have a lot of people who have gone through this journey. Yeah. Uh, hi, Sanjay. And uh, hello, Jeff. Uh, Sandeep here. So the question was put by me. Uh, what I was trying to understand here was, uh, yeah, like you rightly clarified, uh, the project manager may be more inclined towards a scrum master kind of a role when we talk about a scrum team. Uh, but what kind of commonalities do you see between the response, the, the role which a project manager performs and a product manager is, or a product owner is supposed to perform? I mean, well, that's, that, I mean, that's fair. So for me, the decisiveness comes into it. Um, and when I think back to my time as a project manager, um, I was making decisions for other people. I, I really kind of struggled with that to a lot of degree. So a lot of my time was spent trying to get people on board and helping understand what the right decision was. Whereas as a project manager with, with more domain knowledge, I might not need to do that. Um, I, I think about dependencies. I think about sort of road mapping, whereas a project manager, I'd be looking at steps and, and dependencies and links and flow and stages. And, and, and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, stages of the life cycle of the product and the market. Uh, which which are really important from a project manager and a product manager perspective. There's a lot of overlap there. Um, again, when I was a when I was a project manager, I wasn't really involved in things like priorities as such because it was more around um, a sequential order of things. It was much more of a waterfall delivery. So it was a case of well, we had to do this before we do that bit because that team interfaces with that team. It wasn't really end to end um, delivery, which makes the prioritization a little bit easier for a project manager uh, for a product owner taking that element of the project management side of things but being able to rationally analyze things to be able to take a model and apply things um most of the project managers that i worked with i think probably had a, a thicker skin than i did in that um, they were able to to make decisions without worrying too much about the, the personal, what people thought of them, if you like. They, 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 weren't, they knew they weren't there to make people happy as such. They were there to make a good product. Um, and, and the good product will ultimately make people happy. Whereas I think I worried a little bit too much about making people happy to be a truly successful um, project manager, if you like. Does that help? Uh, well, yes, it does. So uh, thanks for your comments, Jeff. Uh, certainly quite inf insightful. Are you, are you on the journey right now? Are you making that transition or are you thinking about making that journey? Uh, I'm thinking about making that, uh, that transition. And, and what excites you about the product owner role? Uh, well, uh, the road mapping aspect for sure. The aspect of seeing something which goes from a concept to uh, design and development to release to maintenance and finally you know the sunset of the product so mm -hmm. this whole 
life cycle certainly is quite exciting. Uh, the, the aspect of experiencing uh, the product from end user's perspective, what value is it adding for the end user certainly excites a lot. So uh, while in a traditional project management, there is only your, your fix between the iron triangle of schedule, scope and cost. Whereas over here, you are indeed seeing the product, how, what value does it bring? How is it uh, making uh, a change in, uh, in others' lives? So that is quite exciting. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I, I, I love the, paint, the picture you're painting there. Uh, and you know, as, as that product owner, you, you do have that, that massive opportunity to see an end-to-end -end impact. Um, so, I, you know, I hear a lot about you know, seeing a, a positive impact on, on users and customers in, in what you were telling me there. Uh, and, you know, the best product owners will, 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 will actually leverage that for, for the development teams as well, so that they get that feeling as well. They're, they're engaged in it and, and they bring the development team on that journey with them, uh, cre creating that shared sense of fulfillment and, and purpose. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, um, yeah, it sounds like that being at the forefront of, of your mind is, is going to stand you in really good stead for being a product owner. So I wish you luck with that. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeff, this is Karthik here. Uh, nice to Hi, meet brother. you. Uh, oh, yeah. Joining from Singapore. Yeah. Hope you're doing good. I'm good, so, thank you. How are you, sir? I, I'm, I'm doing excellent, thank you. Uh, I have, I have a follow-up question on this um, the project manager role that was mm -hmm. you described, right? transitioning from project manager to Scrum Master. So I've been an enterprise agile coach for the last 10 years, and, and, and I, the, one of the common challenges I faced, even with my uh, fellow agile coaches, uh, the common problem that we face when we bring in this kind of a transition from a project manager to a scrum master, when we when we operate on an enterprise level transformation, right? One of the common challenges uh, that we face from the from my client is people are not very receptive to move to the scrum master role. The reason being, right? From when employees are in a project management role, there's a clear career progression for them. Like they know what what is what is next that they they have to look for, right? Like a project manager, a senior project manager, and a program manager, and so on and so forth. But a, an employee who has to be motivated to become a scrum or transition to a scrum master, right? Even the individual is interested to play the role, he or she is not quite clear on what is the career progression. When I I, I don't want to retire as a scrum master, right? So they they look they look for a career progression, and that's where we don't have a clear answer or a strategy uh, to to kind of give them a solution, right? So, what is your thoughts or, or take on this? It's a really good point, um, and I'll be honest with you. And I, I don't actually think there needs to be. Now, I'm aware that I'm I'm in a very privileged position to be able to say that, if you like. But I'll back that up with with my experience of the people who have got into the role generally haven't gone into it for career progression reasons and what they found is when they've been able to make a difference in that role if there were a career progression they wouldn't want it because the, the sense of fulfillment they get from the role they wouldn't want to lose that in in the West, we have this, this phrase, the Peter principle, which is that you eventually you're promoted outside of your level of, of uh, ability. So you're eventually promoted to something that you can't do. Um, and I think that happens a lot more than we would like to believe. Um, we believe that we should be taking the next step on the career ladder or you know, we need the next, um, the next salary increase or something. But from what I'm seeing, great scrum masters compared to mediocre scrum masters are, are, are in, still in such demand that the salary is still good and your ability to to influence change and, and live a role that actually aligns with your view of an organization your view of um, almost philosophy is quite fulfilling for people that they actually are quite happy in that role without there being a next step on the ladder for me, the next step on the ladder for a lot of these people is finding a different industry and expanding their, their view of the world 
like that. So going from banking to pharmaceuticals or, or what have you, just being a scrum master in different different places. Um, I said, it's very easy for me to say that, um, but I think from what I've seen that that seems to be an interesting one. Those that are interested in a career progression, perhaps those are the ones that end up uh, taking an agile coach role because they believe that's that's the next step for them. Good. I, I think we have to move on. So uh, please hold on for your question for now. And uh, let's move to the uh, next one. And I, I hope this helps you, Karthik. So what, what do you think, what do you see the future of this uh, thing called as an Agile or Scrum? What do I think so, of the future uh, of Scrum? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. What, do, what do you think the future of Scrum? Is it, some, I think someone has no, uh, uh, noted it like that. Is it something like in a short term winter season as we have in India or is it in a long term uh, summer season? Well, I think if you find, if you, when I speak to a lot of people, um, when I speak to people, a lot of them tend to say this, this scrum thing makes sense because it was something that we were doing before we knew it was called scrum. So it's, it's a common sense response to a complex problem. Uh, so that I think is, it speaks volumes that if, as long as there is complexity, there will be a need for something like scrum, whether it's called scrum in 15 years time or not, I don't know, but you'll look back and you'll think, yeah, this is quite similar to what we were doing when it was called Scrum 15 years ago. What I see is as the complex becomes more understood, then the need for Scrum reduces. So as, as we do more of the same complex stuff, we're able to, to use guides, get good practices, experience a little bit, and we don't need to innovate as much but there will always be something else that needs innovation. So for me, I can't see complexity going away. So I can't see iterative incremental cross-functional teams going away. Whether or not it's called Scrum is another matter. Um, but that's kind of my view. I'd be interested in Gunther's view on this because he's... Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, very, much, very much in line, uh, by the way. Um, and, and when I started working at Scrum the Talk several years ago, back in 2013, was also one of the things that Ken and I talked about, and, and you've known Ken also very well. Um, and it was one of Ken's questions, and, I, and sort of in line with what you say, I don't know whether it will still be called Scrum, but in a way, I don't know, because we've all seen hives. So one of the things I used to say also, Scrum is not a hype just by referring to the sort of the birth date. I think 1995, can you still call it the hype when it's still around and growing and expanding in and beyond software development? That's one aspect. And also, the reason why I think, like you said, Jeff, Scrum will always be around, regardless whether it will be called Scrum or not, because I can't imagine, maybe that's for the time being, anything more simple than that and still completely effective or efficient or whatever, because if you've got that dual feedback loop in it, you can't do it with one feedback loop only. You can add feedback loops on top of that, depending on the situation, but it, it can't get a lot simpler than this and still give you some control and focus and so on. So whether it will be called Scrum, I don't know, but what I've seen in the past five, six, 10 years even, we've seen things coming up, scaling stuff, frameworks, different names, DevOps, the Spotify model. But when I look into the desire of organizations, underlying what they actually need is something that Scrum can always give them. But they've tried to give it different names and make it bigger. And, and sooner or later they wake up that, yeah, we need the, 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 the pure simplicity actually. And then that dual feedback loop as implemented by Scrum serves them really well actually. Yeah, perfect. Yep. That, that, that's good, that's good. So, and, and just a follow up to it. And uh, uh, the intention is not to create any controversy here. So uh, what are your thoughts on this uh, uh, updated Scrum Guide 2020? <laughs> me? Both of you. Yeah, 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 Job, you can start. <laughs> um, mixed, I would say. 
Okay. So th there's a lot that I like about it. Um, I was I was a big fan of of sprint goals. Uh, even when I wrote Scrum Mastery, I, I, I referred to the sprint goal as the forgotten man of Scrum because it just wasn't really used back in 2013, 2012. It was there, but very few teams really made use of it. And so I, I like the fact that there's a, a revisit on the importance of, of that, having a focus for the sprint rather than just taking as many story points as you can or whatever. Um, I like the fact that it's trying, it seems to be at least, trying to to become a little bit more almost ha in the shoe hurry. So for an example of that would be taking the three questions out and just focusing on the purpose of the daily scrum. Um, as an example, I like that. I, it seems to be treating people a little bit more uh, adult in that regard. Um, I'm not too fond of the removal of the term development team. Um, because I'm not a software person at heart and I, I do a lot of work with teams that are outside of software, uh, I'd sort of managed to, and this is just something that I'm going to have to adapt to really, is, you know, I, I've, I've, I've got my way of explaining that when we say developers, it's not software developers necessarily, because it's a development team. It's a team of people who are developing the product. I had that sort of explanation worked out pretty well, but now we don't have this concept of development team. We just have developers. I think it's, it, it, it brings that focus a little bit too much back to software again, which, which is a little frustrating for me, but, uh, the, the biggest, the biggest thing that, that I suppose disappointed me was, was the choice to remove the term servant leadership from, from the scrum master role. And okay. It's not, it's, it's not that, um, they've necessarily moved away from the theory underpinning it, talking about a, a true leader who serves for me, servant leadership is, is a really fascinating and, and powerful theory and something that's got many many years underpinning it and uh yeah i th i think that was that was a shame because i think you know the scrum master was the one role in the last 20 25 years that had come out and been explicitly around servant leadership and you know, I remember speaking to Ken a long time ago and he deliberately used a provocative term, not provocative in I want to upset you, but a weird name um, because he wanted to generate a little bit of attention about it and just make a point that it is different. It is different to anything that we've ever had before and it's different for a reason, um, but it's not just made up. You know, it's, it's built on some solid theory, some serious academic research and use outside of software. Um, and I think it kind of loses its a little bit of its credibility there, um, but maybe I'm just overreacting to that. What do you think, Anta? Again, much in line. Um, I would I would have personally, like you already hinted at, even even expanded the idea of servant leadership to not just include the scrum master, but even the product owner. Mm. And I believe Sandra, your previous session was with uh, Roman Pisler, right? Yep where uh, he wrote, in my opinion, a magnificent book to demonstrate so how to lead in product management, um, to actually demonstrate how product ownership is also a lot about servant leadership. And the Scrum Guide now calls it true leader, literally between the quotes, which is actually servant leadership. That is true leadership. So why not just yeah, call it what it is? I suppose for me that maybe you and I would view the term true leader to to mean servant leadership but the term true leader may mean something very different to other people who are reading it so that that ambiguity of for well, one person's true leader is not necessarily everybody else's true leader that worries me yeah but yeah. if you look at it the whole guide is like that right it is so short that everybody has their own uh, what do you say uh, understanding of the guide so few words here and there i don't know words don't actually matter that much right how do they well, so, so I, I, I agree the words to a degree don't matter, but in, in another way, words matter a lot um, because people know words and people have their interpretation of words. Now, the, for me, the term, having the term servant leadership, it reduces that ambiguity to a degree simply because it is a concept outside of Scrum. Um, so you don't need to define it in the Scrum Guide because it is defined somewhere else. And it's not just a theoretical concept, it's a practical concept. Um, and it's a challenging concept as well. So 
servant leadership being there forced people to think, well, what does that mean? Now, yeah, maybe a lot of people ignored it or paid lip service to it, but it was there, it was challenging. Now it's not there, now it's not challenging. Now it's a lot easier for people to say, well, I'm a true leader because, and there's no definition of what a true leader is or isn't. Um, that, that's but so, but so, so servant leadership is a great term. It also allowed me to, to say to people, what do you mean with servant leadership? And I like, at least you would have authority without power. Yeah. Your leadership would come from serving people. And it also connects to the previous question on that sort of salary thing and career moves of being a scrum master. That's also the difficult. Great scrum master, the impact of a great scrum master is very indirect. It's very difficult to, to sort of demonstrate. It's also why where scrum masters get their sort of professional pride from, from helping others become better. And, and a, a great scrum master will only be missed when he's not around. When he is around, it looks like everything's fluent and natural and great. But that's also the difficulty maybe in a, in a some of these discussions and so on. But uh, again, and, and that's sort of certain leadership. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I feel sorry it's gone. But. So uh, somehow it looks like it's not less prescriptive. It may be more specific now. <laughs> the new but, scrum guy. But, but, but if you look at that, even that word scrum master, right? Some people are not comfortable with that master word. So uh, I, I don't know. It, Okay, I, I think let's let's move on. Let's move on. So let's move to the next one. I think uh, Binay, you ha you had a question, right? Want to ask now? Yeah, yeah. So so Jeff, my question was regarding uh, enterprise agility or the business agility as a as a home as as a as a total in, in a totality because generally the software or the development. Whenever it happens, they follow this methodology of cross functional team and getting it done. But it does not happen uh, in other functions like, let's say, finance or, or marketing. So I was just wondering, is it a problem? And if it is a problem, then how to get around it? So in a way, it's very similar to my answer from before, which is you start where you are, you become as cross-functional as you can be, and then you, you use Scrum to find out where the next bottleneck is. And if that bottleneck is in marketing, then that becomes our challenge. Is there a way for us to be more effective than efficient? There's no point piling lots and lots of deliveries at the door of marketing without the feedback loop being included within our cycle. So um, the, the, co the concept of self-organization and the concept of done are interlinked there because we're not cross -fun Sorry, the concept of cross-functionality and the concept of done are interlinked there because we're not cross-functional unless we're getting something done. Uh, and if we need marketing to get something done, then that should be part of our cross-functional team. Um, we may well find that it's inefficient, um, but if the effectiveness we're getting outweighs that inefficiency, then it's the right thing to do. So regardless of what the, the skill is or the function is, um, it's, very easy, I, I, it's very easy for um, a technical team to be able to say, you know, everything within our remit, we're cross-functional, we're done but we're not done done because we need this thing from the part of this part of the organization that isn't operating in this way. So we need them to change. Well, I can't make anybody else change, but I can, I can produce something that somebody else might want. Uh, so if I can create a way of working that makes it better for that part of the organization to work in a different way so that they can consume value sooner and more regularly, then that's, that's probably what I need to do. Uh, stop asking them to change, but give them something that they want. Um, that that's that's the natural process that I've seen from organisation to organisation. And the more it becomes seen as we in this part of the organisation are doing this, and you need to do this, the more resistance you get. It's just like telling my kids I want them to do something; they'll deliberately do something else or not do it, right? Because they want their autonomy. They they don't like having their independence compromised and challenged. But if I can create something where they would want to do something, then we're both going to win. Yep. Yeah, good. Thanks. Yeah, good. I, I think that's a good point about that cross functionality. Cross functional. Uh, the general assumption it's more about just coding, testing, or all those technical skill. But it it goes beyond it. Whatever is required to create that done. 
yeah software is just a part of the process in almost yeah. everything it's just a part of the value chain it's a yeah. big part of the value chain in many places and it's a really quite obvious place to start for many organizations and scrum scrum appeals to that part because that's the the founders um, experience and background and that's where the history of scrum well, the recent history of scrum not the history history of scrum but the recent history of scrum has come from um, but for many places it's easy to for that to become something that it is doing to the business rather than doing with the business or maybe even doing for the business it's, there's no there shouldn't be a split right because you don't get business you don't get value from it without business that's true that's true. for me for me that's a really good reason also to be sort of scared sometimes by this sort of things, I, I call it sort of gravity also, where people try to, I don't, I don't, I don't see um, that sort of typecasted forms of agility. Agility is agility. There's no technical agility or business agility. Even, even looking at the Etzel Manifesto, one of the principles, it says business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project to throughout the work. Yeah, so that's one of the things that also fascinated me uh, recently, read uh, the book by Uncle Bob, to Bob Martin, for whatever other provocative figure he is. And that was a good reminder. He said, you know, around the time of the Edson Manifesto, Ken Beck, extreme programming, kept saying it's one of the biggest things we have to overcome, that dichotomy, that sort of gap between business and IT. And I'm sort of scared. So because agility, it's not just a business thing. It's also not just a technical thing. It's at most for me an organizational or enterprise state that you're looking for. So enterprise agility, I can get that. I don't know what technical or business agility is because in, in line with what you've said, it's not really, you need both to be successful or deliver value. Hmm. Yep, and uh, this, uh, this reminds me, uh, help me recalling in a, another change in which was made um, in the Scrum Guide. That's about changing the development team from an, a self-organization to the self-management. So oh, 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 what, what is your, uh, your take on it? So well, I'm, I'm, I'm keen, first of all, to, to understand why, that, why you like that. So what was it about that that you liked? Oh, this is for me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So for, for me, I, I think I read it somewhere and somehow I feel that self-organization may be just a part of the self-management. Okay. So whenever we use the word self-organization, it looks like that, hey, we, we, you are supposed to do your work yourself. That's it. That's all self-organization. But I think it, it goes beyond that. That may be the very basic level of it. Right? We, it can be maybe how, 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 how we are going to form our team. Yeah. Yeah. On which product or which or maybe on with which commerce we would like to work. That may yeah. be the next level. So that, that may be the moving into a in a pyramid where we have a self-organization, maybe at the very basic level, or maybe even uh, just above the, the command and control the, or the project or some, uh, uh, someone else telling us this you, you should do. So for me, I didn't see it as a change. Yep. I saw it as a natural consequence of them removing development team because before the development team was self-organizing, but the scrum team was self-managing because the development team were responsible for the how while the product owner was responsible for the what and the why. Now, together as a team, they have product owner responsibilities and accountabilities and development accountabilities. So they are responsible for the what and the how, which is where self-managing typically lies. Um, I would always, I don't teach much, but when, when I teach it, I would always teach that there are different degrees of self-management. Um, and I'm a big fan of all models being wrong, but some being useful. Uh, an incredibly clever bloke called Richard Hackman wrote about um, teams many years ago. And, and he talked about different levels of team autonomy, if you like. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing there is just having that conversation. Well, what are we responsible for? What are we not responsible for? What would we like to be responsible for? What do management not want to let go of? Why? What would make them comfortable with that? So I, I still think self-organization and self-management are vague, ambiguous terms where all parties would benefit from a little bit of a conversation about what does that mean for us right now? Um, what would we like it to mean in a few months time if we can build up our trust and we can build up our confidence and our competence, then would we benefit from, from a greater 
transfer of responsibilities because I don't think it's static. Yep. How about you, Gunther? Do you want to add? Uh, no, no. I, I, I like um, the word self-organization a lot because also it ties back, first of all, to the new, new product development game where we get the name Scrum from in the first place. Talks about self-organizing teams, the natural, the, the, the built-in almost things in that arises from um, not intervening, so allowing them to self-organize. I like the idea of uh, self-organization being people forming organized groups around a problem uh, without external interventions, at least. And then, in, in a way, and then thinking about what are we exactly self-organizing around? In what domains? Is it only the work within the sprint? Is it also the skills and expertise available in the team? Is it up to, I don't know, uh, learning, self-learning, self-development as people? So I, I, I don't know. For me, it, it just disconnects us a little bit also from, the, again, that statement from the Agile Manifesto, best things, whatever, uh, emerge from self-organizing teams. So I'm, I, I don't know. I don't know what it will give us. But it, it, to, to align with Jeff, it, it, whatever the word we choose, and that's why I don't think it makes a lot of difference. You have to still yep. think about what is it that we self-organizing, self-manage, not sorry, how do we do that? So as, as long as it's an invitation for people to have a good conscious decision about what is it that we're allowed to do, um, it's probably fine. Yep, that's good, that's good. Okay, let's move on. Let's move to, I think Kiran has a question. Kiran, are you there? You can un unmute yourself. Yes, I am, I'm here. Yeah, 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 Kiran, go ahead. Though we can't see you, by the way. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's fine, I guess. Um, so, I mean, it's great to see uh, all the stalwarts here, with uh, Jeff and uh, you, Sanjay. So, but the question that I had was, uh, since Jeff uh, had experience with both the Scrum Mastery side of things and uh, the product ownership side of things as well. So, in his experience, what was more difficult to achieve in terms of the mastery? Was it people mastery or was it uh, product mastery? And why is that? I, I don't... I'm thinking on my feet now because I've never really thought of that before. I don't think there is a difference because I think just mastering anything is very, very difficult and takes a significant amount of time and discipline and reflection. Um, I think if you found the role that plays to your strengths, then it would be easier than trying to master a role that didn't play to your strengths. Um, so I've known some people who have, who have tried one because they had something that they liked about it, realized that actually they would be better at something else. And so their overall journey to, to mastery has been longer because they tried down one path and then they went back down another. Um, but I think, you know, if I was to, to suddenly start playing tennis um, and playing golf, then my time to mastery would probably be about the same, um, relatively. But actually what it takes to master both things might be different, if that makes sense. Yes, Jeff. So uh, one of uh, the questions that was underlying uh, this question was, uh, you know, uh, when you spoke about uh, the mastery in one particular aspect. So there are also advocates uh, talking about T-shaped skills, right? So do you think this is different in such cases? Um, I would say, again, just, just speaking instinctively, I would say no. Uh, I would say that that's effectively mastering being part of an agile team. So it would be mastering something. And becoming T-shaped doesn't mean that I need to be an expert in six or seven different skills. It just need, means that I need to be some degree aware of them, perhaps even uh, be able to have a conversation about them. Um, maybe I could do some of them to a degree. So um, it's not necessarily about mastering multiple things. It's mastering the balance between my area of interest and specialty with 
a broader awareness and understanding to help the team in that context. So there's, there's a, almost a plasticity of my, uh, of my brain to a degree, which I think we all have, um, to, certainly to, to enough of a degree to help us fit into that. I think even product owners are T-shaped to a degree. There will be parts of the role that they will be better at. They will enjoy more. They will learn quicker naturally than others. Same with the scrum master. There'll be parts of, of the role that scrum masters are better at, that in, they enjoy more, they have more passion for. And so they will be slightly T-shaped there as well. Um, if you look at a, a sports person, they're not I-shaped. They, they have strengths and they have things that they aren't quite as strong at. Uh, and that's normal. Uh, they don't have to be perfect at everything. Life would be very boring if that were so, as much as we may crave it. Thanks for that, Jeff. I like the analogy. Good, good. That, that's great. So we have maybe five more minutes. Maybe the last question anyone would like to ask. There was Somebody one who has uh, not asked uh, anything yet. Kavita was asking some question, right? Yeah, yeah, Kavita, go ahead. Oh, um, thank you. I was asking about the weighted shortest job first. Uh, I mean, typically we have the masker method like must-haves and all those, and we do have the weighted shortest job first. But then there seems to be so much confusion around it because it's an assigned number. It's not a calculated one. So what is the best way? Like, you know, every company has its own, like, you know, it all depends on the product manager that chooses it. So what is the best way? Is there a equation or is that the perfect way of calculating it? Um, the short answer to that is no, there isn't a perfect way because all, in my experience at least, all definitions of value involve some subjectivity. Uh, because you're talking about the unknown, you're talking about what I assume my users are going to find valuable. And even if my users have told me this, I can't be sure that they're telling the truth. And even if they think they're telling the truth, I can't be sure that their actions will match their words. Uh, I was told about a, um, a Sony Walkman user study where people were asked what color of Walkman they, they preferred. And I can't remember what color they, they, they ended up saying, let's say red. We like red. Um, and so, oh, thanks very much. As a, as a token of thanks for, for taking part, please take a free Walkman. Uh, and they all took the black one. So even though they said the red would be better, they, their actions didn't match up with what they said. So it is an element of, of gambling. There's an element of risk. There's an element of uncertainty and an element of subjectivity and interpretation. So my, when I work with product owners, I, I tell them, first of all, that that's okay. Because quite often they're, they're, they're under the impression that they have to try and get rid of their objectivity. But part of the reason they're in the role is to, is to put some of their subjectivity into it because they are there to interpret multiple, multiple different things. And a lot of successful products, our users don't know they want them yet. So there's got to be an element of that. In terms of the, the sort of method for doing it, the weighted shortage job first, it's, it's absolutely fine. To me, there's so many different ways of doing it. All of them have potential, but none of them are going to be perfect. So accepting the imperfections is the most important thing. And having the conversation about, well, what are we, what are we doing about those imperfections to try and mitigate them? So my, my for those of you that have read my book, you'll be familiar with... Um, my preferred method of doing things in the book, I called it Greg dollars because I didn't want to be too egocentric, but now I, now I refer to it as Jeff dollars. It's going to take over the world, putting a Jeff dollar value on something relative to something else. And it's not that that, that feature or that story or that Epic is actually going to give us that amount of dollars in the bank when it goes live. It's just that based on my understanding of the product, based on my understanding of the market, my users, the, the weighting and the balance, the dem demographics of my personas and, 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 and audience, I believe that this is X amount of value compared to this 2X worth of value. Uh, and if you take into account the development effort estimates, so 2X worth of the value is the same amount of effort as 1X worth of value, well, I want the 2X worth of value, please. And it's not so much about that that's right. It's about that it's a little bit easier to understand and we're wasting less time to come up with an inaccurate measurement of value. And so rather than worry too much about velocity or story points or anything like this, I'd much prefer product owners to have a bit of a conversation about normalizing Jeff dollars because if project A or product A is able to deliver 
200,000 Jeff dollars worth of value in three sprints and product B can only deliver 100,000 Jeff dollars worth of value. Should we not be focusing more on this one rather than splitting it 50-50 or, or what have you? And, and having yeah, I that guess conversation- especially since we are trying to deliver value here, so it should be more geared towards understanding value rather than any uh, approximate number. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. right, it's going to be wrong, but let's try and be relatively wrong, just like we have done for years with our estimates. Let's try and be relatively wrong. Correct, correct. I like that. But then that 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 solely will depend on that particular product manager to that particular team. So do you think there will be a problem when you look at it from the program level perspective? So the only problems that I see in, in, in reality are where I'm incentivized to do others, to do other things. So for example, product owner A is incentivized somehow, either bonus, reputation, whatever, to make sure that my product gets delivered. Whereas if I'm incentivized to make sure that the company gets more value, then I'm more likely to say, do you know what? We don't need to spend as much time and money on my backlog because the real value to the organization is over here and I benefit from doing that. Okay, thank you, sir. No problem. Thank good, you. good, good. I think we are just on time. So I think we have to stop it here. So again, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to everyone. Thanks a lot to you, Jeff, to Gunther, Kavita, and all the participants for joining. And thanks a lot for uh, spending time with us. And I hope it was worth of your time and it was worth for you also, uh, Jeff, connecting with the, uh, with the, with the participant. Thank, that was thank, fantastic. Thank, thank you for inviting me. Th thanks a lot. Thanks thank a lot you. to all of you. Thank you. Thank Take you. care, everybody. Thank you. Have a thank great you, day. Sir. Have thank a great you. evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Gunther. Bye, everyone.